All right. Welcome, everyone, to the broadcast. I'm Sam Charrington, founder of Twimmel and host of the Twimmel AI podcast. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by an amazing set of panelists to take on the emerging topic of data-centric AI. Now, data collection, transformation, labeling, and annotation have long represented the most expensive and time-consuming aspects of developing machine learning models. And yet, the ML and AI community has emphasized the importance of model training and associated model parameters, algorithms, and architectures as the key to achieving improved machine learning imp performance. Data-centric AI has recently emerged as a trend towards a more balanced view. It recognizes that model performance is hugely dependent on not just the quantity of training data, but on its quality. Data-centric AI suggests that investments in data collection, curation, augmentation, and quality improvement techniques, tooling, and platforms can be more effective at delivering high-performing real-world models at lower cost. We believe this is an important trend uh, for those building real-world machine learning systems, and we're very excited to dig into it in this session. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to share a few quick announcements. Starting this Sunday, July 3rd, the Twimmel community will be meeting for a study group following along with the recent NLP with Transformers book by Lewis Tunstall, Leandro Von Wera, and Thomas Wolfe. If you're interested in joining this group, I encourage you to head over to twimmelaicom community to join our Slack community, then join the NLP with Transformers channel for the most up-to-date information. Thanks again to study group host Shan Sudin for putting together and leading this group. Next up, I want to officially announce the upcoming TwimmelCon AI Platforms Conference. Join fellow ML and AI practitioners and leaders to explore real world challenges of developing, operationalizing, and scaling machine learning and AI in the enterprise. In its third year, the conference will continue to focus on the platforms, tools, technologies, and practices necessary to enable and scale enterprise ML and AI. TwimmelCon AI platforms will take place October 4th through 7th and will be hosted virtually for easy access by our global community of ML and AI practitioners and leaders passionate about deploying, building, and, and integrating ML and AI solutions. As with previous years, we'll be sharing a wide range of technical and case study sessions, keynote interviews, in-depth workshops, and panels. Uh, learn more and sign up for updates at twimmelcon.com and stay tuned because we'll be opening up registration, which will be free uh, very shortly. All right. Please keep in mind that while I do have questions prepared, we would really love for you to be the main driver of today's conversation. Please send your questions in via the chat where our team is moderating uh, and I'll make sure to work them into the conversation. Finally, we're looking forward to bringing you more discussions like this on a wide range of topics. To be notified when we schedule future discussions, subscribe to our newsletter at twimmelai.com slash newsletter. All right, and now let's introduce our esteemed panelists. Please join me in welcoming Adrian Gaydon, Head of Machine Learning Research at Toyota Research Institute, or TRI. Audrey yeah. Smith, Audrey Smith, COO at ML Twist. Hello. <laughs> Charlene Chambliss, Senior Software Engineer at Aquarium Learning. Hey. And Janet, uh, Senior Director of Data Science at PayPal. Hi, everyone. All righty, so let's just jump right in. Uh, I had an epiphany this morning, and that is that I should start out every panel discussion with a dad joke. Uh, I know my team is groaning right now, so uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. My first question is, does anyone know how do you make holy water? You boil the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to set the tone here. We're not taking ourselves too seriously. Uh, we're having a good time and we want to uh, involve our audience in this conversation. Uh, by way of introduction, let's start off by having each of you briefly share a bit about your experiences with data-centric AI. Uh, Adrian, let's, let's have you start. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, um, I'm originally a computer vision person, so dealing uh, um, before deep learning with small data. Uh, then after 2012, uh, dealing with uh, becoming a deep learning person, so dealing with big data. Um, and now, uh, for the past six years, I've been more of a roboticist, dealing with uh, embodied data. And so the type of data and the quantity and quality that's available and the processes around um, data-centric AI have evolved over the years and, and evolved, you know, basically uh, with, with my different roles. And I think one of the main things that I learned um, in this past few years is how embodied intelligence is very different and how robotics is very different um, in the sense of it's not just uh, a few Python uh, uh, program, a few lines of code of Python, you know, to get a web crawler and mine a lot of data and train a robot. It's a bit more complicated than that uh, because it's related to physical interaction with the environment, safety critical, things like self-driving cars. So data-centric AI, I think, means different things for different applications. And in the space of robotics, uh, it has its own uh, set of challenges um, and that I'm sure we're going to talk about today. Awesome. Audrey? Yeah, so um, I've been introduced to machine learning uh, almost eight years ago now, and I've been in data labeling operation for all this time, um, working on different formats from uh, audio, video to text um, and, and images. And um, because of this role uh, as a data labeling operation person, um, I have been focusing on data uh, since like for, from day one, uh, making sure that the highest quality possible uh, is reached for a, a, any use case that I was working on. Um, and meaning that I was able to work with a lot of different people from product managers to data scientists and um, uh, domain knowledge experts to also leveraging the best tools on the market. Um, when you mentioned data curation, but also data augmentation, synthetic data, and so much more that I'm sure we're going to be covering um, today. Um, and the idea is really like to have this combination when you're a data labeling operation person between um, the different stakeholders that you need to deal with, uh, but also the right technologies, uh, always do, with the same focus, which is reaching the highest quality possible for the data before it hits the machine learning model. Awesome. Janice? Yep. I've been in this uh, data science machine learning space for 15 plus years and mostly focus on fraud detection. Uh, all this time, data is a very important piece of the equation. We spend a lot of time on making sure that the data is a good quality, we procure the right data, and uh, it's a company-wide effort. We have different teams focus on different aspects from uh, having the right uh, data platform, having right data governance, and when it comes to uh, individual projects, we spend a lot of time on making sure that the quality of data is good for the particular problem. So yeah, uh, I guess that uh, data has always been a very important aspect, and uh, over time, we know there are like new techniques and recently renew uh, focus, uh, more focus, I guess, uh, on this uh, data on top of algorithm. So uh, we'd love to hear from uh, different uh, people, different teams on like uh, what are the new things that are being introduced in this space because the data is just a fundamental piece as a, of the overall data science space. All right, awesome. And Charlene. Hey, I'm Charlene. Um, my experience with the topic of data-centric AI comes mostly from my time as an ML engineer at Primer AI where I built and shipped multiple NLP models to production for diverse tasks like classification, named entity recognition, and relationship extraction. Um, for my first year or so at Primer, I also managed the data labeling operations for the team and helped shape our process into something that could more reliably produce high quality data sets, but also on aggressive timelines. Um, and nowadays I'm with Aquarium Learning as a senior software engineer. And our product focuses on helping ML and ops teams quickly diagnose quality issues with their data sets, find areas of improvements for their model, and quickly sample new data for training. So now I get to work directly on helping folks solve this problem, which is a really fun position to be in. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So next, I want us to level set on what it is that data-centric AI really means. Uh, on our pre-call, I expressed some misgivings around, you know, getting caught up in the semantics of this. But Adrian proposed what I thought was a great idea, and that was having us each try to boil down our thoughts on the topic to a single defining sentence. 
Uh, and so I'd like to uh, have us share those and then we can dive into a conversation about them. Adrian, what do you have for us? Right. Uh, putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, yeah. So you I forgot think, your homework. No, no, no. Um, I did my homework at first. Um, so I think my sentence would be, I, I try to be as boring as possible because it, there's a lot of hype, right? So here, uh, it's, uh, let's not create controversy on the definition. At least that's my intent. So the most boring definition of data-centric AI I could come up with was improve downstream performance of machine learning models by iterating mostly on the training data. That's, that's the most boring version I could get. Uh, uh. Audrey? Um, I would say it's a combination of two things. The first one is uh, putting the right people in the room from day one, uh, as soon as you start thinking about your model and what data you need, meaning technical and non-technical people, and also being able to leverage the right technology for the right use case. It's all like also like sorry, just to add on the data preparation side of things. <laughs> awesome, awesome, Janice. Yep. Uh, I probably would put it even more simple: is a uh, focus on data in the AI uh, solution lifecycle, because that uh, data is just uh, so fundamental. Uh, we need to put as much uh, attention to it as uh, in parallel to algorithms. Charlene. I think that uh, Andrew Ng framed it really well when he kind of framed the distinction as data-centric AI versus model-centric AI, because for a long time, the field was really focused on iterating on model architectures, optimizers, training methodologies, uh, which makes sense because at the time it was primarily being driven by academics. Um, but nowadays it's primarily being driven by industry and real world applications. Um, and so the difference there is that, you know, in academia, you don't necessarily have infinite money uh, to hire labelers to make these gigantic data sets, nor do you have access to, you know, a product with millions of users that you can kind of harvest data from. Um, and so we're seeing this kind of interesting shift where we're acknowledging like, okay, our models are actually really good learners now. So we need to focus on teaching them the right things. Um, it's kind of about prioritizing what goes into the model rather than the model rather than the model itself, so that we can unlock the business and societal value that comes from that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mine is is similar to Adrian's uh, and is inspired by some of Andrew's writing and the emphasis on a, a systematic approach. Uh, Data-centric data AI is a systematic approach or having a systematic approach to improving and iterating on training data as a way to improve overall AI system performance, stressing the quality of data and labels over the quantity. Uh, so it doesn't sound like we're, you know, identifying the, the kind of controversies or the poles uh, of the conversation here. We all kind of generally agree um, uh, about what data-centric AI is, uh, I guess the next question is, in, in a sense, why are we talking about it now, right? We've been saying for years and years, we've been throwing around this 80% of data science is dealing with the data and only 20% uh, is the models. No one's ever been able to cite where that comes from, but we have all repeated it, I'm sure. Uh, raise your hand if you have not. Um, why are we talking about data-centric AI like it's, like it's new? Any, any takes on this? Janice? Uh, yeah, my take is, uh, I guess over the years, there's a uh, a lot more hype on the algorithm. Like people are talking about deep learning, um, uh, basically a lot of attention, a lot of conferences about algorithm. But like uh, the data, as you said, is 80% of the work, uh, are we kind of maybe uh, not paying as much attention, maybe we have forgotten some of the fundamentals. And also I guess that there's some new requirements like a responsible AI or some, some of the newer requirements that we need to spend a lot more focus on data, uh, data these days. So I think having this like a branding and having this attention will be able to help us to uh, make sure that we have a balanced approach between data and algorithm. Uh, that's my approach. Uh, that's my take on it. I think it's just like a kind of balancing the two sides, data and algorithm, with uh, recently so much hype on the algorithm, and maybe we're not giving enough attention to this area. Mm -hmm. But Janice, not necessarily new in your opinion. Right. It's more like a, we need to make sure that we have enough focus to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Adrian, I thought you had an interesting take on the importance of naming things. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's a Tolkien expression that I really like. Uh, um, uh, there's power in naming things. Actually, 
uh, my collaborators, they know that I uh, allocate a, a lot of importance uh, to names of methods and titles of papers. And I think that what's new with data-centric AI is the name. <laughs> As you suggested, there's a lot of stuff that, that, uh, that have been going around for a while. Actually, when you were talking, it reminded me of this Twitter account called uh, Big Data Borat, you know, that was talking about <laughs> the 80% of like cleaning data and 20 so, and it's been around since big data, right? Since the unreasonable effectiveness of data paper, right? Uh, in, yeah. in 2005 by Google. So what changed is not just the name, of course, that's that's a little bit in jest, although there's there's truth to that. Um, but um, I think the deep learning, right? Uh, it takes a while, right? So now everybody thinks in their mind it's 2012, but I lived through 2012. I defended my EPHG in 2012 and I was working in convex optimization, kernel methods, like learning theory, right? Vapnik world. And then overnight, throw everything that in the garbage can because deep learning, non-convex, voodoo, woohoo, et cetera. So it took a while for computer vision people. It took a year or two years to kind of like accept the evidence. Uh, for roboticists, depending on which roboticist, some people are still have to accept it. <laughs> uh, and so deep learning is, is, is what changed the name of the game because before SVMs, et cetera, they didn't need as much data. Uh, they didn't get as much benefit from data. A lot of the previous benchmarks, even in the academic community, were saturated with data. So it took Fei Fei, uh, Fei, Fei Li, professor at Stanford uh, from ImageNet fame, quite a lot of vision at the time to make a million, uh, like millions of images, uh, uh, data sets uh, with ImageNet. Because at the time, it was not clear that it was needed. And, and she had almost perfect timing. She was a little bit early in the game. Uh, and then, boom, uh, you know, it happens. So I think, and it's been continuing, right? With the models becoming bigger and more data hungry, data started to have a bit more um, uh, place at the table of concerns. Um, and, and with transformers, even more so, because now people think, um, uh, and, you know, with evidence that we can use generic models for a lot of different tasks. And then we can have more data as the main variable of adjustment. And this is the, this is the exciting part also, because this is where it's a lot of art uh, more than science. And so this art is slowly getting into a practice, right? Into uh, best practices around uh, data centrism. Um, and then hopefully one day it will actually be a science. You will be able to buy a book, just like engineers say, how to build a bridge, you know, it will be how to build a data center, <laughs> you know? Um, we're very far from it yet. Mm -hmm. Charlene, you had an interesting take uh, last time we spoke last time we spoke about, uh, in your experience, the relative performance of data quality and, and model training. Can you uh, share that with us? Yeah, totally. Um, one thing that's been interesting to see as kind of an on the ground practitioner um, uh, is that, A, there are a lot more kind of, um, there are a lot more people coming into ML from different diverse backgrounds and like starting out their careers in ML right now. And, uh, what they're finding is that when they're going to build a model for their organization, um, they're looking around and some of their coworkers are spending more time on the algorithm uh, and kind of tweaking hyperparameters and trying to really uh, optimize the architecture in a certain way. And then other coworkers are spending more time just iterating on the data set. Uh, and it turns out that the folks who spend more of their time on the data set are getting their models out the door a lot more quickly. Um, they're delivering more business value. They're getting promoted faster. Um, and so from an incentives perspective, you know, even just for the practitioners, it makes more sense to focus on the data at this point. Awesome. Audrey? Yeah, um, I was... Um... I like what Adrian said about like the fact that now we're getting into a data centric uh, world and like what does that mean uh, in terms of the people that will be working uh, on that field and making sure that the data is right. And um, that's what I was talking um, to you about the last time we, we chatted, Sam, is that I feel like now there will be uh, a new role um, that will be really needed that has been there for a little while, but not as much as I thought it should be, um, which is data labeling operation people that are not technical people, but that and that who understand technical requirements and who are able to translate them into most like simple um, instructions for the data labeling workforce that would be there to 
create the data accurately, but also consistently. Um, that comes also with best practices, that comes with like general workflows that need to be applied. Uh, there are like certain recipes that work really well, depending on the format uh, of the data, depending on what the data scientists want to um, recognize uh, uh, or get out of the data. Um, and I think that, as you're saying, Adrienne, that there will be like like a science around data labeling, I think, and data prep, prep in general, I think there will be um, maybe one day um, uh, some, you know, uh, you could go to uh, the university and then become a data labeling operation person somehow. Um, I believe that's the future. So we'll see. <laughs> so I, it sounds like in a lot of ways as an industry or as a community, we've got this kind of love-hate relationship with labels and labeling, right? Data-centric AI is very explicitly a reaction to kind of the costs and challenges associated with hand labeling data. Um, I'm thinking back to a recent uh, episode of our data-centric AI podcast series, I spoke with Shine Mahanti um, and he dropped the spicy take that manual labeling is actually harmful to the machine learning process. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, any reactions to this idea. And I'll maybe throw it right back to you, Audrey, since labeling is your life. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think again, like it, it goes back to what I just said. I think that there are like best practices and there are workflows and there are like um, guidelines to follow on how to do uh, well when you're labeling with humans. And um, if you come as a data scientist and then you create your own task and you don't try to adapt to the, the, the crowd that's going to be the one labeling your task, or you don't think about all the different edge cases that can be um, you know, contained in your data set, you don't think about bias, you don't think about how you're going to um, uh, get your quality control done, how you're going to get feedback to the crowd is doing the labeling. And, and also there is also this idea that you know, if it's simple for the technical person, it has to be simple for the crowd. And if the quality is not good, that means that the crowd is not doing well. I think that there should be like a shift in the way, of, like uh, the way we're thinking about it and making sure that the best practices and the workflows in place are driving efficiency, consistency and accuracy. And, and that's something that um, is, required to get high quality data. Obviously, if you don't do that part right, you're going to get bad data and you're going to, you're going, obviously it's going to be harmful. So um, that's, that's, yeah, that's what I think about it. Yeah. Charlene? I was going to say um, real quick, that's interesting. It makes me think of um, managing certain data labeling tasks at Primer, uh, particularly named entity recognition, which is a task with so many edge cases. Um, you would never think that it's that hard to identify, like, what's a person in this document? Like, what's a location? Um, but it turns out, you know, sometimes University of Arizona is a location. Sometimes it's an organization. And that's the case for, like, thousands and thousands of other things. Um, and so I can understand uh, his point when he says manual labeling is harmful because one way that people try to solve for this is with consensus labeling where they just throw like five different people at every document and they're like, we'll just average out their annotations <laughs> into something usable. Um, but like if you do that, you know, with hundreds of documents, you end up with a difference of like thousands of entities, like depending on whether you take two out of five agreement or three out of five agreement. And so at some point that just like doesn't make sense because like your model is getting a lot of mixed signals um, from using that data. And so it becomes more important to, uh, you know, rather than using consensus, just really focus on ironing out those edge cases and making it really clear kind of what principles and what mental models to have in mind as the labelers are labeling um, and even examples of like how to handle certain edge cases as opposed to just general vague guidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Janice? Yeah, I want to add that, like, uh, that definitely uh, there's pros and cons with human labeling. Uh, there are some problems more suited for human uh, labeling with is more black and white. And uh, I guess some of the, but there are some other problems is more blurry and like, uh, let's say it has to do with intention. For example, when we look at fraud cases, like if we ask human to do labels, sometimes it's hard 
by just looking at like those evidence. So uh, we need to employ different ways. Like uh, for example, uh, Charlene mentioned, maybe we have multiple people, so like have voting system, or like uh, we can have a mix of like active learning, or actually sometimes we just want to observe the longer term customer uh, reaction to it. So we, there are different ways to do labeling, I think, uh, and different, different ways as it's uh, pros and cons. We need to combine the different methods to get us the best way to uh, have the best label at scale. Awesome. Adrian, I, I hear you're labeling's biggest fan. Manual oh, yeah. Labeling's oh, biggest yeah. Fan. I have a love-hate relationship with, with labeling. <laughs> um, actually, do you know what the labeling party is? Have you a ever labeling done party? a labeling party? Okay. I So, okay, I have a little story. So, um, I, I won the Pascal VOC challenge, which is the ancestor of ImageNet, back in 2008. as a big challenge, even at the time. Um, and one of the cool things that happened was it was organized um, uh, by the late Mark Everingham, who now has a prize in his name, you know, for, for contributions. Um, and he had designed this benchmark, which is really what then inspired, you know, ImageNet and other things. And uh, so as one, this, it kind of put me on the on the map a little bit in computer vision. And then uh, Andrew Zissman, as a professor at Oxford, as like one of the legends in the field, invited me to come spend uh, two weeks in Oxford. I was like, great, giving a talk there and, and et cetera. <laughs> But it was also a labeling party for the next edition of the Pascal VOC Challenge, where a lot of grad students were uh, using a MATLAB interface to label for semantic segmentation. And that's where my love-hate relationship for labeling came. As I love using labels. I hate producing them. <laughs> um, and so and then, you know, um, so that's why I started to work on ways to avoid that. And ultimately, in, in robotic space, um, and especially safety critical applications like self-driving, you know, it can take up to four hours to label one image, right? Because that 25 pixel pedestrian, you know, it might be safety critical. Um, and the level of QA that you have, like the quality analysis, the quality insurances that you have to do is kind of like very, very high standards. So everybody has hundreds of pages of labeling guidelines, uh, in, internal annotation teams, or at least internal QA teams. It's, 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 it's serious business uh, to do labeling. Uh, as I'm sure Audrey and, and basically everybody in the data center space can talk about. And so that's why one of the things for me that moves the needle is, I, I've mentioned it, the mo my most extreme point of view is all the labels should go to the test set. I agree with Janice, actually, that the solution is, is, is in the gray, right? It's obviously semi-supervised. You need some labels to train. You need like some pragmatic approach. But if I try to like say the most extreme ideal that I have in my head is all your labeling budget should go to your test set. You'll always need labels because evaluation is statistical. So might as well maximize uh, your test set because that's what really how you know how you get certainty before deploying, right? And in safety critical applications, you want to be pretty sure that your system is safe um, and a statistical system, right? So um, so that was my ideal, and so that's why in my research uh, I've worked a lot on auto labeling. Uh, self-supervised learning, using synthetic data. So all these ways to avoid the cost of labels at training time, even though in practice, so that's my research hat, but I have my engineering hat, which is obviously label part of your training data, obviously, right? Um, but the cool thing we found uh, at the intersection of both, doing both the research and the engineering is that semi-supervised learning is really bottlenecked by what you do with the unlabeled data. Part of it is saying which part you label, which is called active learning. But part of it is, well, even if you label a part of it, you have all this rest, what do you do with it? And you can learn very useful representations from the unlabeled side, which is why I think semi-supervised learning uh, is bottlenecked by things like self-supervised learning. And this is what we found in our, both in our research and in our, in our practice. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I want to pull in a question from our audience. Uh, Audrey, you referenced, uh, kind of alluded to good data versus bad data. Uh, Marat is asking, uh, can you elaborate or can our panel elaborate on, you know, what the right data means? What is good data and how do you know uh, which of your data is good? Uh, I'll let you start with that, Audrey. That's a very good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I think that that starts with having the right people in the room. Again, I think I repeat myself again and again. Um, 
I, as, as a non-technical person and as a person that I really act as, you know, like more like as a cross-functional position, trying to make sure that everyone talks to each other, understand each other. Um, the idea is really to understand at the very beginning when I start a data labeling project, I understand what the machine learning engineer or data scientist wants to do with that data. Where do they want to go? What, how are they going to use it? Why do they need that many images annotated? And uh, why do they need to have like a timestamp on a video annotation? So there is really like this idea that we need to understand where they want to go. And then from there, we can create the right task. Um, but again, it includes also feedback loop and quality control, because even though uh, I'm going to be translating everything in the best way possible so that the crowd can label it the right way and consistently, um, there will always be inconsistencies at the beginning. There will always be uh, some edge cases that were not covered. Um, and, and that just requires a lot of a teamwork between the different stakeholders um, and and having some quality control done by the machine learning engineer that wants to get the data is in my sense um, a number one requirement because they are the ones that will be using the data and they need to be involved. I know it's it's not the, the most like fun part of their job. I know it's not like really exciting to work on data labeling, but having them involved is really critical to uh, to get the right data in place. So I would say good data means right data for the machine learning engineer who's going to be uh, working on the model. Charlene, any experience with uh, trying to identify the right data? Yeah, I absolutely agree with the way Audrey framed it about it being about uh, how do you actually want to use the data? Um, and that's going to really dictate kind of how you frame the task, how you end up evaluating performance on the task, like how strict do you need to be about certain rules? Like our customer is going to be okay with these kinds of outputs. Um, do you need to prioritize precision or recall? Uh, so all these things that are kind of dictated by the actual use case. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of my thoughts about it. <laughs> yeah, what about this idea that um, you know we've we've been kind of driving towards more data, more data, more data, but in some cases, actually less data, less data is the the right approach. Does anyone have any experience with uh, the, you know these ideas, data curation, and, and things like that? Charlene. Okay, so I, I do have a quick experience with this, um, funny okay. enough. Uh, this was like uh, one of the first models that I was training at Primer. It was a uh, relationship extraction model um, where the task was to identify like who is the employer of some selected person. Um, and so I had about 500 like hand labeled examples that I had given to the model. Um, and then I was like, okay, but can I make it even better? Um, and so I labeled like another 200 examples. Um, and then I went to test the model and the performance had actually gone down, like recall had gone down significantly by like 0.2 F1. Um, and so I was like, what the heck? And then I actually, I went back and looked at the data and I realized like it was all following kind of the exact same pattern where it was like person name, you know, employee at Tesla or something like that. Um, and so the model had basically overlearned this one pattern. And so it had kind of forgotten like other types of patterns. Um, of like employment uh, in text. And so it's definitely the case that if your data is not diverse enough, you can actually make it worse by giving uh, the model more data. Yeah. I've, Adrian? Yeah, I also have a cool story like that. Um, this is actually a kind of, um, uh, I was talking about like art that like dark knowledge that becomes kind of best practices and being in the silicon valley actually has a huge advantage of like people chatting with each other about all these kind of like war stories so here i can also give you a little bit of that uh here one was sometimes the best thing you can do is deleting part of your training set and that seems very weird because you paid good <laughs> money for those labels you know uh, and you have 95% inter-annotator agreement and, you know, the labeling company is like, yeah, this is the best, et cetera. And then what happened was that there was one engineer uh, in the driving team, uh, Mark, uh, that was interested in, um, like, you know, working more into ML. And he saw that was the future and he wanted to learn uh, a little bit. So, at, at, you know, in the evenings, we we're uh, sticking around uh, in the office, just the two of us. And I was teaching him some basics, but like on our data. 
And then, um, you know, something that computer vision people don't do nearly enough, I completely agree with Audrey, is look at the data. So I was showing him stuff and looking at the data, and he was like, yeah, that label is weird. That label is weird. It's like, oh, yeah, you're right, but eh, they're just outliers. And then, you know, going home, and, uh, and, and Mark is very focused. So he went through all the data and, and started to flag things that he thought looked uh, not okay. And that was half the data set. And then retrain the model, like push button with just half the data set. And then results were, you know, 2% better, which was a bigger improvement than we'd achieved, you know, uh, with any single update before. And I was like, what? So at first I didn't believe him. So I went and looked at all the data I rejected, looked at the logs and stuff like that. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, and that was like five years ago. Uh, so I think that's, uh, you know, with the data, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So that's an example of ugly. <laughs> uh, you should be, um, you know, periodically revisiting. And so some of it is the data quality, mm. right, obviously. But some of it is more pernicious because it's the world is changing, you know. A very, very big assumptions we're making in machine learning, which is very fundamentally flawed, is IID, right? Everything <laughs> is independent and identically distributed. Uh, guess what? The world is not IID. Otherwise, it would be like the movie Memento, if you've seen it. Uh, so it's, it's, it would be terrible. Um, and in self-driving, in robotics, in, in, you know, in many other applications, I'm sure Janice can talk about fraud detection or, or any of the panelists, it's, it's sequential decision-making. The whole system is a huge feedback loop. And so decisions impact customer behavior or impact you know, uh, the, the behavior of the robot, impact data that comes in. And this whole loop as a big feedback loop. And so IID is very bad assumption, and especially for data centric, um, because now you're shuffling the data. And as Leon Botou, a famous machine learning person, uh, you know, popularized SGD in deep learning, said, uh, nature uh, does not shuffle the data. Um, and I think that's a big, big issue with what we're doing now, and part of it uh, contributing to hurting uh, in the data centric space. Got it. Uh, I want to take another question from the audience. Mahavir asks uh, along the same lines, um, you know, getting the right data, quote unquote, can be tedious and take a long time. What data points have you all used to convince management uh, that there's ROI in um, spending that time? Uh, any, any thoughts on that? And, and we'll start with you, Janice. It's a, I would say pretty easy show, like, a, for example, we have a, clo a global company and uh, there are a few markets that were more dominant versus like there are some newer markets that we have uh, less data. So it is a easy show that, let's say, if we just like, oh, uh, maybe man very upper management things that we already have a lot of data, like why do we still need to spend time to get more data? Um, <clears throat> because like uh, basically, uh, it was uh, also mentioned by Shani, like basically the dominant trends will basically, uh, Shadow everything else. So uh, with that, we can like build a model. Easy to show that hey, uh, maybe it's a, a model with a lot of data, but maybe it's a very tuned to U.S. market because with that's a market we have the most data in. But what if we want to address some of the newer uh, emerging uh, places like uh, Latam or some other countries, but we have where we have very little data, uh, we can show that when we separate out the performance of those like uh, newer markets, maybe we will have much lower performance because we don't have representation, we don't have enough uh, enough data points over there. So uh, I guess once we break down the performance, show the upper management that hey, uh, without those data, we will have good performance in some pockets, but like a much lower performance in some pockets, or maybe sometimes some bias in some uh, some pockets, then it's easy to show that we need to spend time. Even though overall scheme is a lot of data, but uh, we need to make sure that it's representative, is uh, covering all the uh, different pockets, and also it's in good quality. Otherwise, uh, the performance just by itself will show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 will, I will also add to uh, the question. Um, I think uh, Janice uh, and, and Audrey uh, and Charlene, maybe we're all in the same situation, which is it's easier to convince management when you're management. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> um, I think that's one thing in machine learning where it's important to have technical leadership. Uh, I think, you know, there's this kind of like dual cultures of management, right? Of like people management, just to prove expense reports and, and, you know, and then the other side of things, which is just like technical leaders. Um, I think in my experience, it's kind of, unavoidable to be leading from the front in machine learning space because it's such a deeply technical and not fully understood space um, that if you have to educate your manager uh, in addition to do your job, eh, uh, this might be a, a bit of a tough cookie. 
Um, and so I think performance does speak for itself. So if you're in a situation where your manager is not an ML savvy person and it's kind of like um, uh, doubting uh, the hype, you know, some people are like that, including in the robotic space. Uh, and so, but performance speaks for itself. So articulate a problem, articulate a benchmark that is at the scale where um, the management says, okay, I can approve that, you know, um, and maybe you can do a bit more on the side uh, if you're really passionate about it. Um, and then the performance uh, should speak uh, for itself. Uh, and that's why data-centric AI is kind of spreading like wildfire. Because when Charlene was talking about uh, her examples, and like I think everybody here on this panel has examples of like being surprised uh, by focusing on the data for a little bit. So my experience is actually the opposite. It's harder to convince ICs than management. And for the reason actually mm -hmm. Audrey mentioned, which is it's not as sexy uh, working on the data and labeling and correcting stuff as, ooh, this new transformer that just came out from DeepMind, you know? It's like, so I think that's, that's what's harder is to get people, like Vincent Van Hook has a great uh, blog post as like a head of uh, Google Robotics um, on, uh, you know, like managing research teams that I think applies a lot to machine learning. Even the engineering side has a little bit of flavor of research and it says, shoot shiny objects on site. And that's really hard. <laughs> when you have like surrounded by shiny objects, which is 100 papers in archive every day in our field, right? Like not joking. So, so I think um, getting people to focus on the data uh, is not so much of an up management problem. It's more of a down management problem in my, in my experience. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I want to add to that, that like, I think the whole data-centric AI, uh, one thing is also bring attention. I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of hype and a lot of attention on algorithm. This is the shiny objects. Basically, people think machine learning is so cool. It's a, it's a really thick, cool later, uh, factor to it. <laughs> so like, uh, I guess we need to bring more attention. Like, data is equally important. It's equally sexy. So we need to make sure that like, uh, from all over the organization, we pay enough attention and spend enough focus. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of continuing this thread of uh, practical takes, we've kind of, you know, defined uh, data-centric AI, and we, we've talked about a lot of aspects, but um, I don't know that we've kind of really nailed, like, how do you do it? Um, and, you know, maybe the question is, like, how do you start if you're in our audience and you think that this is a compelling conversation or a compelling idea, like, what do you do? Uh, and, uh, or, you know, another kind of way to, to look at that question is, you know, for the, the ICs that are on the ground, like how does their experience change uh, in a, a pre data in a model, cent model centric view versus data centric view? Any takers on that? How about you, Charlene? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Um, I think that framing can really help with this. Um, so Adrian was getting at this earlier, but like it, it's actually, in my experience, harder to convince ICs to focus on the data um, because, and I, I think this is because a lot of people, you know, they got into AI because they think the tech is cool. Like they're really interested in the math behind the models and like how it works. Um, but like in order to get in order to get started with this approach, I think it's it's maybe important to kind of uh, tie in that understanding of how the data interacts with the model, maybe um, on like a mathematical level. Um, and that way you can kind of summon that interest like in the data um, in order to uh, like put that same focus into the data curation process as opposed to just the sort of model tuning process. Um, in terms of like actual processes to put in place, uh, it kind of depends on where you're starting from. So it's a little bit hard to say exactly. Um, but you know, if you've been using like off the shelf academic data sets, um, first of all, stop that. <laughs> uh, you can use that for your pre-training, but um, you're gonna have to actually go and get custom data for your task uh, most of the time, unless you're doing something pretty basic. Um, and so you need to actually like work with the subject matter experts in your domain, whether those people are like in your company or outside of your company and you, you need to hire them. I'm sure Audrey can say a bunch about this too. Um, but you actually need to be willing to um, 
go and define that task and work with all the stakeholders and figure out like what exactly um, is the use case that we're working towards and how do we get that data. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass it along to, uh, to someone else who can say more about that. Audrey? Um, yeah, I think I've seen like, depending on the company, depending on their knowledge about how to go, like on how to get the highest accurate data and, and so on. I've seen startups that don't have the budget, like data scientists are working on that. And I get that this is like, again, it's not super sexy. And so when they work with like companies like, like ML Twist or they're working with data labeling operation people, like, and, and we hold their hand and we say like, don't worry, we're going to get there. This is how to go about it. It gets, it gets actually quite interesting even for them. It gets like quite sexy even for them because all of a sudden they realize how they can impact the quality of the data just by simple following simple steps and just like following a workflow and, and so on. So um, I, I'm very passionate about data labeling. So I think I guess I'm, I'm able to, to give that <laughs> to the people I'm working with. Um, what are some of the, like, some examples of those steps, those simple steps? Uh, the the very the very simple ones is the the ones I mentioned earlier is that like if you start and you know what data labeling you need to do to get the data you need for your model, um, try it yourself. I think that's the number one rule. Work on the task yourself, even if it's like a hundred images or fifty images or or text annotation, just do the work yourself because that's when it's going to really help you understand if you have covered every potential use cases that uh, every person, sorry, potential use case that would be in your data set. Um, and, and that's the number one rule because that's going to help you refine your guidelines, your step-by-step -step guide that you're going to give to the workforce so that they can annotate the way you want them to annotate the data. So. Um, and, and that's very simple and, and that might be like obvious uh, when you think about it, but it's a very different experience when you try the task yourself. Um, when, when it comes to bigger companies that have already the knowledge about data labeling, um, the, definitely like the, the experience is, is way different because they have they have they know already the impact of of doing it of working on a data centric approach and then all of a sudden the discussion is is different it's not about like taking uh step by step and baby steps on how to get there but it's more like okay how can we do it even better what type of data labeling tool out there can help me get like you know all these uh thousands of uh brands for uh, um, a coffee pod that would be like just annotated in like less than 30 seconds. So we're talking more like as Charlene mentioned about um, aggressive timelines, how to reduce the cost, how to reduce the timeline for delivery. Um, and, and it's a much different conversation, but there are like different, different levels, definitely, depending on mm -hmm. where you start. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think Janice, Janice wanted to jump in as well. Uh, sure, yep. Yeah, first is a mindset. Uh, we talk about it as a, I think first we mindset and culture. So very important. So people have the passion to build, uh, to do it. And second is having the right tools in place. Uh, there are a lot of like already like uh, open source or, uh, on the market. That's all uh, tools out there that will facilitate the work a lot. I think the principles and the work that's needed is not like super complicated. It's just about uh, are we applying the right, uh, right methodology and the right tools will really help with that. So uh, don't... Uh, having all those set up, then people will understand the value and also make it much easier to accomplish as well. So I guess that those are the first few steps to begin with. Adrian? Yeah, I completely agree with what Audrey and Jenny said. Uh, I think that dog fooding, uh, starting with dog fooding is a really good idea. Like building your own data sets, uh, getting your hands dirty, uh, you know, or being part of the, you know, if there is already a pipeline, you know, joining the pipeline, at least for quality checking, you know. Uh, if not, mm -hmm. not for labeling, uh, I learned a lot by just quality checking labels, you know, uh, labeling parties. I've actually organized uh, labeling parties at my work uh, to do that, you know, incentivizing with pizza and stuff like that, which was both for getting better data, but also for getting people to look at the data and understand a little bit more. And that's a huge driver also of creativity, of insights uh, into not just the domain, but the whole labeling process and things like that. So huge uh, plus one for that. Maybe to complement, one thing I can add is that 
That's also why I fundamentally believe that there's a danger. There's something called Conway's Law, which says that an organization writes software <laughs> that's is structured in modules like the organization's teams, right? So you have like in self-driving cars, for instance, you have a perception team that does the perception module. You have a prediction team that does the prediction module. You have a planning team that does the planning module, right? And so one of the problems is that there's another law, which uh, it, it says that the law of leaky abstractions, all abstractions are leaky. And I think there's a kind of a danger of having vertical silos, like the data silo, the ML silo, which contributes to also maybe the slow uh, adoption of data-centric and ML teams, because they were they had a data team that were dealing with data and they were dealing with the models, right? Um, and so I think that ML people need to be more involved uh, in the data operations, whether it is by having the organizational structure in place to have ML and data under the same roof or just having really good cross-functional collaboration. I think that's really important. Now, in terms of tooling, uh, some, so we've done, um, taken some steps uh, for that. Uh, the first steps we've taken for us was uh, governance. Because in safety critical scenarios, uh, applications of machine learning, like self-driving cars, which are not super regulated, um, uh, you have to decide um, how much you want, uh, how, how safe you want to be, right? And, and, uh, and so in car makers, like Toyota tend to be very safe. So some of the things that were important for us is AI, AI safety. And so it starts actually with simple things in the data space, which is like traceability. So we've had an open source uh, library called the Dataset Governance Policy, or DGP. And that's been instrumental to how we know, like there's no GitHub of data, right? And at a certain scale, it's really hard to do data versioning, tracing, and stuff like that. So it sounds simple because for code, we have Git. It's so easy, right? But for data, it's very, very hard, especially because of the human in the loop, uh, many humans in many loops. Um, and so I think <laughs> that having traceability, having integration in different systems, uh, that's also why we are one of the first customers of weights and biases uh, to have all this experimental management, to have the code, the data, the experiments, and all the human decisions in between um, as connected as possible. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so I think those kind of like data governance uh, is a good thing to have in place. Getting your hands dirty and building your own data sets definitely plus one. Continuing on this thread of tools uh, in the context of data centric AI, um, you know, we hear a lot about different tools, technologies, uh, and the things that come to mind are, uh, you know, data creation or data curation, you know, synthetic data, programmatic labeling, weak supervision, active learning. Um, I'm curious to, do, do you, do we think, are these foundational, you know, tools that are, you know, required for data-centric AI? Are they uh, important things to have in the toolbox, but not necessarily foundational? Or are they shiny objects that are probably more of a distraction? I'm a huge proponent of self-supervised learning and simulation. So <laughs> I definitely don't think they're shiny objects. Um, I think, like, you know, one one thing that people underestimate is accessibility of data, uh, right? It's like for certain safety critical scenarios or privacy uh, for reasons or ethical considerations, you know, it's not like you just ha have harvest the data from all your users. Certain applications you can, a lot of applications you can't or you don't want to. Um, and so I think accessibility to data is a big challenge. And so either you have access to a lot of raw data, um, but you cannot, you know, label it. Uh, or you don't want to label it for certain things, um, but it's still part of the real world. So it's still, there's something to learn from there because it's still part of the world that your system is going to operate in. So that's where self-supervised learning is there. The main question there is, is self-supervised learning absorbing or worse, amplifying uh, the biases in your data? And that's why we've done some theoretical studies, including an iClear paper we presented recently to show that at least for imbalance, which is a very natural bias, ubiquitous in data, um, uh, Actually, self-supervised learning learns more robust features to that bias um, than supervised learning. So that was a great thing. There's another one, uh, which is uh, simulation, which is if you don't have access to your own data, uh, you need to create it. And in robotics, uh, a big way is uh, synthetic data, uh, generating simulation, especially, again, for if you want to learn to avoid to crash, you shouldn't be having crashing millions of real cars you know, uh, to learn to avoid that from experience. That doesn't so overall, scale. It, it, it maps out to a very simple, like, uh, view of the world, which is you have three types of variables. You have the known knowns, which is what you can label, right? You have the known unknowns, which is 
you know they exist, you know, uh, like, you know, like, uh, the, you know, like a dead animal on the side of the highway. That's a real example where people told me we need to make sure we the car behaves correctly there. And it's like, well, what am I going to do? Take a shotgun and shoot animals or like corpses on the highway? That's like, I mean, no, <laughs> you know, that sounds insane. Um, and so simulation is there, which you can very easily generate scenarios for that. So that's the known unknowns. What you what you call programmatic data generation, uh, programmable data, right? That that's what simulation is really really good at. The known unknowns. But then you have the heavy tail of the unknown unknowns, right? All the crazy things that can happen in the world, they happen, right? And, and, and you have to have your model be either robust to that, meaning being able to say, well, here, you shouldn't trust my prediction, right? Out of domain detection, et cetera. Or said, I need to have access to all the data and learn from all the data to be able to recognize when it, when it happens, even if it's just to say, don't trust me. Uh, and that's, for me, where self-supervised learning uh, comes into the picture. So again, we need everything on the table. The problems that we're dealing with is so hard. Every tool uh, is needed. Any additional takes on tools, Charlene? Yeah, I think some of these things can be more useful than others, depending on the area. So like one thing that you run into in NLP is that data augmentation isn't really a thing uh, because you can't just substitute words in a document <laughs> and <laughs> like for a synonym or an ostensible synonym and expect it to like mean the same thing or even like have the same label afterwards. Uh, and so you have to get a little bit more creative about how you end up um, getting new documents to label. Um, so one thing that helps a lot is similarity search. So if you project all of your documents into embedding space. Um, you can actually search that space um, using nearest neighbor search or something like that. Um, let's say you're trying to increase recall specifically, you know, you take all your positive documents, you project them, and then you select more documents from your unlabeled set that are close to those in embedding space. Um, so that's one way that um, something like that can help. Active learning also helps a lot when you're still kind of initially exploring the space. Um, so one algorithm we implemented at Primer was something called Corset, um, which is a form of active learning that prioritizes um, covering the entire uh, data distribution. Um, and there's some very fancy math involved in this, but there are like implementations that you can use. Um, and essentially, it ensures that you have explored the diversity of the data, even just in your first like 50 to 100 examples, instead of like taking a random sample and just hoping that, you know, most of the things and, and the edge cases that you would want to see are in that random sample. Um, and so you definitely have to get creative with using some of these methods, depending on, uh, like Adrian was saying, you know, what level of access do you have to the data? Like how much other data do you have um, and various other constraints? Got it. Got it. Uh, so if the question is, is it about people, process, mindset, or tools, the answer is yes, 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 and yes. Uh, we are coming up on the top of the hour, and so um, let's do a really quick round of uh, you know, top one takeaway for our audience from your perspective, and if you can keep it to less than three words, all the better. Adrian? Ooh, um, listen to our discussion with Sam about principle centric, uh, because I think that <laughs> data centric, we don't know how to design data sets and we need to know how to be able to teach machines. And that means including designing data sets and injecting what is not in the data set. And um, we didn't talk about it today, but uh, we made a whole episode with Sam so people can check it out. Awesome. Audrey? And that's a very tough one. Um... I think that, yeah, no, that data quality, uh, obviously we all know now, uh, by now that it's like, that's the new oil, the new gold or however you wanna, you wanna call it. And, um, and you need like a lot of different people in the room, I hope. And, and we chatted about it the last time also as, uh, with, with you, Sam, is that, um, we need to get more people in the room that are coming from different backgrounds because that's going to help us a lot of different issues that comes with data centric approach as well, which is how do we go into like more ethical, you know, data? How do we remove bias and, and so on? And so having like a mix of, of, of different people will really help on the top of 
definitely leveraging all the different technologies out there and uh, to come back to what we discussed, like what Charlene and Adrian were talking about, I believe that technologies are, they're all great, all, all, all the ones that are there, we are very lucky to be um, uh, using them uh, right now, but depending on the use case, depending on the industry, depending on the field, uh, not all of them should be used and there should be like this <laughs> way to unify the data labeling ecosystem and just pick the right tool when we need it on the top of the right people. Awesome. Janice? Uh, overall, I would uh, reiterate data is as important as algorithm and is uh, as sexy as algorithm. There's a lot going on in this space. Uh, data is sexy. Of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, we talk about a lot of things in this one hour. Actually, there's a lot of activities going on and also they require a lot of deep skills as well. So I would encourage uh, everyone who is uh, in the AI space, in the like uh, machine learning space, uh, pay as much attention to data and also uh, build all those knowledge on what it takes to build a uh, the data-centric AI to apply the right uh, quality, uh, how to do synthetic data. There's a lot going on, so and there's a lot to learn. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, if I had to summarize mine in three words, I would say get better tooling. Um, because uh, A, like right now, there are so many companies coming out with really interesting MLOps tools that can help you so much with this process of iterating on your data set and iterating on your model. Like you don't have to write your own scripts for all this stuff anymore. Like you can literally just buy a solution. <laughs> um, so try checking out, uh, first of all, better labeling tools um, because there are labeling tools out there that have kind of QA built into the labeling process. And so it'll help your labelers do the right thing and avoid doing the wrong thing, uh, which results in better quality data for you. Um, and then secondly, uh, data management. I, I, I'm a little bit biased, but I say check out Aquarium for data set management. Um, we help you keep track of quality issues. You know, team members can collaborate on uh, different issues with the data set. Um, you can explore your data really easily with the embedding view. There's a uh, Many, many other features. Um, so definitely, uh, you don't have to do all this alone. Uh, get the right tools and uh, it'll help you solve your problem with a lot less tedium. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, well, we are going to wrap up. I want to start by thanking our panelists for uh, their insights and contribution to this session. Uh, thanks team for pulling this together. Uh, the recording of today's discussion will be available on YouTube immediately. So uh, if you're out there and you want to share it with your friends, uh, just send them to the YouTube URL. Uh, big thanks to everyone who tuned in and uh, once again to our fantastic panelists. Uh, to stay up to date on the next one, please be sure to visit twimalaya.com and sign up for our newsletter. And you can also follow us on Twitter at twimalaya. Uh, and of course, be sure to uh, sign up for updates at twimmelcon.com. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Thank you. Bye.